So, I thought I had gotten out of seeing the shack since it just left our theater, but, uh, it turns out that it's still playing in other places, and the stars aligned, I guess, to, uh, get me to, uh, seeing it still. Um, and I didn't really know much about what it even was. I was under the impression for the most part that it was some kind of Nicholas Sparks-esque thing, which I suppose it kind of, it's like, uh, it's like a Nicholas Sparks story by way of, I struggle to say pure flicks, but in the, uh, in the pattern of these religious movies we've been getting a lot lately. I wasn't aware it was such a religiously themed movie. Not that, not that that can necessarily be, not that that automatically means it's going to be bad, like pure fix, pure flicks level, but, um, I, I don't know. We're still, we're still treading kind of a line here. Um, it's worth noting that, um, the, one of the, I couldn't help but wonder if maybe this will be one of those movies again where maybe it makes more sense if you've read the book or something. I don't, I, sometimes I think that's a bit of a sorry excuse because it's kind of the filmmaker's job uh, to make sure that you get everything that you need to know without that. Um, but even so, and one of the writers on this was um, Dustin Cretton who did Short Term 12. That's a little surprising. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't have expected this to be... Maybe maybe he needs money for another indie movie or something. Uh, let's... We'll say that anyway. I think he's doing... Um, what is that? The Glass House. with He's working with Brie Larson again. Maybe... I don't know. Maybe that helped him fund that or something. Um, so... Uh, we begin, and we've got Sam Worthington as our star, who uh, Desmond Doss really got through to him, didn't he? Because he... <laughs> <laughs> He's uh, right back here in this um, Bible-related material. But first, and he tells us, you know, that this is going to be a story about a shack. Uh, but not just a shack. No, no, no. The shack. And if you're... Well, I'm sure if you were interested in this, you've probably long since seen the movie. And I think it came out with Logan. So it's like at least three weeks old. But um, if for some reason you aren't familiar and you've come across this... Uh, the shack is not quite what I was expecting it to be, um, because we start off, well, actually, before we go into that, uh, our actual start here is a very hilariously overdramatic, uh, childhood that we see Sam Worthy in his childhood before he grows up and has his own family, and it's, I mean, I mean it's, it's... It's a terrible situation, and there are situations like this that really exist, but I mean, the way this is portrayed in this over-the-top fashion, where he has the, of course, he's got an alcoholic, abusive father, uh, and of course, he's got the woman down the street that offers him apple pie when things get bad, um, and his mom is just there, she has like one scene in his as his punching bag, and then we get this... We go in kind of a dark place, and then we just skip ahead, and he's an adult now. And you think this is going to play a huge part in what's going on, um, but 95% of the time, not really. Um, well, they, they, the, I think the writers think it does, but uh, we'll, we'll get to that in a second. But um, the main plot here, and where the shack comes into play, is that they're a family. There's like what, three kids. There's um, an older boy, an older girl, and the younger girl. And he's married to Rada Mitchell. And they're gonna go on a camping trip. And everything's going happy, and everything's great. And you know he's telling her stories about the stars and shit. And then eventually, three of the kids go missing because they meet up with this other couple. And two of the kids come back. But it's like, oh, by the way, we haven't seen her. Uh, so still, she is still missing, and they eventually find some blood and a piece of, like, a torn-off piece of her clothing in this shack. And you think, oh, okay, it's a missing girl movie. Well, no. It's, well, for starters, um, she's been gone for about 20 minutes, 
and there are four sheriff cars and the FBI. So they, <laughs> you want to, you might think, oh, well, they must be jumping to conclusions. Well, that's not the end of the conclusion jumping because this entire movie appears to be based on an assumption made by four sheriff cars and the FBI. <laughs> And that is really the only thing the movie gives us, and this is the problem, is this is what we have to invest all of our emotion in from beginning to end. Like, from the very beginning to the very end, we just have to go with this. And that is, the cops are like, well, you know, there's a serial killer in the area. He must have gotten her. The end. Uh, your, I guess your daughter's dead. And they just accept that. Uh, <laughs> there's no... There's really nothing left. Like he, if he, if that's what happened, he took the body, or she just vanished. Um, so they just go on this assumption immediately. Like I think there's like, what, like a seven or eight year span or something before you can like legally declare somebody dead who's still missing or something. I could have that wrong, but that's what my memory's telling me. Um, but no, she's gone for like twenty minutes, and it's like, yep, serial killer probably got her, and this. <laughs> Okay, so, um, and then that's what we go on. Now, from here, you would think, well, where does it go from here? Because Worthington has, you know, these moments where he's, he gets he gets a letter in the mail um, that's signed from God. And he assumes that it's, I, I kind of love that the first, <laughs> through, like, the first part here, uh, Tim McGraw is the very, you know, nice, church-going guy, a very Tim McGraw character, if you don't look at Friday Night Lights. And it's... <laughs> and so, because I guess he's the church guy, um, Sam Worthington assumes this is some really sick prank, so the first person he goes to is Tim McGraw and accuses him of it. Um, and then they very quickly, surprisingly, come to the conclusion... Well, it, 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 I guess God's sending you letters now. Because there's a scene, I mean, I guess, you know, the potential murder probably, you know, changed him and his mind's not in the same place. But it is worth noting that when they were at the campsite and he was talking about how, yeah, they have a nickname for God and that's my wife's thing, but that's not really my scene. For a guy who says this isn't really my scene, um, it doesn't take him long at all to convince himself that he's he got a letter from God in, the, in his mailbox. So, there were no footprints in the snow. That is, that's his concrete proof there. Um, it may or may not have still been snowing when the person walked up to the mailbox, but whatever. Uh, no snow prints means God. So, <laughs> anyway, so once he goes, and he decides he's going to go back to the shack, and he's going to take a gun, he's going to wait for the Duke, because he assumes this is a message from her killer. And so he's like, he's being psychologically tortured or something. I was like, well, this is... Not what I was expecting. Um, but you know from the setup they're going to take a religious angle, so you just kind of have to wait for it. And then, <laughs> um, once he gets there, he suddenly goes from... Like, this could have been, like, one of those quiet thrillers in the vein of, like, in the bedroom or something. Like, imagine this progressing like this, and him feeling like he's being psychologically tortured by a guy who's sending him letters claiming to be God. <laughs> um, when his daughter's supposedly been murdered by a serial killer. Um, there are so many psychological aspects you could make out of this. Uh, but as I said, it's a religious movie. So, he gets there, and a dude walks by, and he follows the dude. Because that's what you do. Uh, when you think there's a serial killer on the loose. Uh, well, he tempts him by saying, you know, I think there's somebody who wants to see you. And so it's like, whoa, you know, oh my god, is that me? My daughter's alive? That means she's somewhere and he follows this dude. Turns out this dude is like one of three people that represents God physically, but he also said later that he was human. You remember what I was saying earlier, how I wonder if reading the book would make this make more sense? I don't know. I don't care to find out either, really. But anyway, where the guy leads him is this place where we go from snow suddenly to the woods. We, he goes into what dreams may come. That's what he does. Um, and we learn that Octavia Spencer is God, I guess. And he is her son, but he's also human. Is he Jesus? I don't know. The movie does not touch on this. He does walk on water later, though. Um, 
and there's also another person there. And this is this is kind of a somewhat interesting concept where it's like God is like technic I guess what they're playing up as God is like three people. And there's like there are three people with three different personalities, but they've all got the same mindset. Like he can have a conversation with Octavia Spencer, and then he can walk to another location, and the other woman will be there. And it's like he can continue that conversation he was having with Octavia Spencer. Um, that's there's something there, but um, the trouble is, is that this it it kind of he pretty much stays here for the rest of the movie. And it kind of turns into one of those, I guess it's like, this is a movie that's made for those people that like, whenever everything seems to be going wrong in their life, uh, their first instinct is to just blame God and say that God is responsible for all the bad things that happen. Um, and he has a lot of those scenes where he goes off on Octavia Spencer for saying, you know, like, well, you know, you're God and you're supposed to be all good, but you let this happen. So you let all the bad stuff happen without doing anything. And it's basically Octavia Spencer's character here gives the same kind of message that Bruce Almighty gave. <laughs> when, when a Jim Carrey comedy beat you to this material 14 years ago and you're trying to play it off as super serious and super profound, um, something, yeah, you need to, you need to catch up. And that's the thing, too, is this movie, <laughs> this movie is two hours and 12 minutes. Yeah, that's long. And I'll tell you why it's long, is that we have this scene, and this happens, where he blames Octavia Spencer for all the bad things, including his supposedly murdered daughter. Um, and the movie makes its point. It's like, oh, okay, yeah. Uh, but this scene happens, like, three times over, in a row, consecutively. Uh, and then you're like, okay, I'm starting to understand how this movie gets to two hours and twelve minutes now. Um, and they really don't do anything particularly different than all kinds of stories like this. Like I was saying, it's like what dreams may come, just in one location and without the creativity. Uh, that's pretty much exactly what this movie is. And there's... I mean, Worthington tries to bring something here. I know... When Avatar came out, he was kind of seen as this kind of, you know, bland kind of person just in the lead role that didn't really give off anything memorable, didn't have much charisma or anything. Um, but it's clear, I, I had heard he was much more respected in Australia at the time. And as it kind of goes on when we see stuff like, you know, Hacksaw Ridge and this, he's kind of, kind of slowly making his way back into... Um, he's like, I don't know if it's just because... You can easily compare him to Jai Courtney, and there's a huge similar. It's kind of like they're descending in greatness. It's like you start with Joel Edgerton, who is right up here, and then you have the somewhat lesser Joel Edgerton and Sam Worthington, and then you have the somewhat lesser Sam Worthington and Jai Courtney. <laughs> um, but even so, um, but he's kind of as he keeps going in his career, um, like particularly in. Um, American movies, he's starting to kind of find his place here, and he does have some strong scenes here, which is even more of a shame because it kind of shows you that in these strong scenes that he has, the potential of the places this movie could have gone, and it doesn't, and it's, <laughs> it just kind of sticks itself in this one place, and there's also, it's a lot of, um, it's, it's basically like this place is a literal land, where this is one of those places where wherever you go, like, whatever you're thinking or whatever you're doing, um, all the metaphors play themselves out in the reality within this place. Uh, like, the scene where he's on the boat, and it suddenly the water turns black and he's starting to sink, and it's like, well, isn't this, like, somewhat heaven? Why is this happening here? But then somewhat Jesus guy tells him, you know, this is what this is what's in your head. This is how you're feeling. You have to get out of it. And it's like I can actually I almost saw an interesting movie in there because it was like what if what if everything around him just like played out as such, but without Jesus guy over here saying, you know, like, oh no, that's happening because this is what you're thinking. Like what if all this stuff just started happening? And it was all, like, like we as an audience had to put it together ourselves. 
as to what exactly meant what. Um, with like each random surreal event happening in this movie has some symbolic meaning about what is going on in his emotional journey. Um, but no, it's, it's, it's not like that. It probably would have been more thought-provoking, thus more memorable in the long run, but, uh, it's, it's just all, you know, played out crap that we've seen a bunch of times before. Um, it doesn't really do anything with it, and it probably would have added more to this whole predictable thing about, we know, this movie takes two hours and twelve minutes, um, to get to some closure, if you can call it that. Um, when really it's just, this, it's the same, we know exactly where it's headed. We know it's going to be a story about moving on and forgiveness. We just have to wait over two hours for this dude to get there. And that's the thing too, is even though the movie is so long, the payoff is not there. Like the whole dad thing, the whole abusive dad thing at the beginning, the whole thing they set up, um... It all comes down to, obviously, he's going to have to reach a point of forgiveness. The whole point of the movie is, you must forgive the guy who may or may not exist, who may or may not have killed your daughter, who may or may not be dead. <laughs> and when he does that, that's our emotional payoff. And there's like one scene that's like a 30 seconds long where he sees his dad, and he's like, I forgive you, dad. That was, that's what that whole setup at the beginning was for. <laughs> for <laughs> um, so, yeah, I don't, I mean, I know, like, forgiveness is healthy, and that's how you supposedly move on and stuff like that, but I mean, really, this dude beat the holy shit out of you and your mom. There's a scene at the beginning when he's whipping him like a slave outside in the middle of a thunderstorm. <laughs> And then, like I said, we don't even know what happened to his daughter for sure. It's all based on the assumption of the cops. And just saying, don't worry, I forgive you, is going to end all of his troubles. <laughs> um, I don't know. I feel like there's some pieces missing here before we get from one place to the other. I don't know. Um, so... With that, and like, I guess something about the symbolic stuff. Um, they could have done more with that. There is one thing that they don't really ever mention that I liked, and that was, uh, obviously God is Octavia Spencer, and she plays him up through this whole thing. And one thing they never mention is that woman I was talking about that gives him the apple pie when he was a little kid, when he was going through all his troubles that helped him, was also Octavia Spencer. That's kind of an interesting, you know, symbolic thing that they actually didn't... They, I like that they didn't even draw attention to that. It's just in there. Uh, and if they had been able to do it more like that, maybe they would have had something. But, um... This is... This is just another one of those... Just, you know, go through the Bible... Like, stick to the Bible and stick with God, and then all your problems will be okay if you just forgive the people that fuck up your life. I <laughs> I don't know. Um, I'm sure there's a, I'm sure there's a decent message in here somewhere, and I'm sure it will affect some people. But <laughs> um, I just I don't know. There's a whole as with these movies, there's a whole lot of miscalculation, and I know there has actually been some people that have been, you know, really disliking it because of the whole mishandling of the Bible's message and stuff like that, and just the elements of it in general. Um, I guess I feel like this movie isn't, like, bad, bad. Um, that could be based on the fact that we have the Pure Flix movies. And, like, if you want to see a mishandling of the Bible's messages, I mean, that's, that's where you want to go. Like, this movie is, like, you know, extremely, incredibly mediocre and has some really not-so-great messages whose hearts are in the right place. Um, but they seem to really half-ass it despite all the time they give themselves. But, I mean, it's not like... Like, you, you, if you've never seen a Pure Flix movie, you have not seen a total and complete dismembering of the Bible and what it means and all that other stuff. So, this is very, um, this is quite forgiving. 
<laughs> go figure. This movie is quite forgivable, actually, when you think about, you know, where we could have gone with it and what it's... I mean, I know you... I, it's, that's like saying, you know, you can praise any movie for not completely sucking, even if it's still not good. But, I mean, there's... It's certainly... When you ask somebody to compare it to, that it just takes the same material but does all the wrong things with it, when you see it with its heart in the right place, there's a little something in there. Um, and like I said, uh, Worthington and stuff is able to, and Octavia Spencer to an extent, is able to put something potent in here, even if it really isn't doing a whole lot to elevate it. Um, so, yes. Um... This movie, and, you know, just to top, just as the cherry on top, um, even so, even if they didn't go into, like, an in-the-bedroom style thing, which is what I would have done, um, going into the whole, you know, magic lands and seeing, like, a three-headed god, in, in a sense, um, it's kind of amazing how boring you can make a movie with these elements. Um, but this movie pulls it off. So, um... That's, uh, that's what the shack was for me, anyway. So, that's what's going on here. I, I'm pretty sure I'm probably going to go... It was, um, I didn't know in the Power Rangers video, but I know now. I believe it's Ghost in the Shell is the next movie. Um, so I guess I will do that. I do not have any background knowledge whatsoever on the source material, but I will do my best to look into it so I don't completely fuck up when I do this. Uh... And as I said, that, um, that verses with, uh, a couple of movies that mean a lot to me that are kind of set in this modern teenage world are, uh, that's Friday, I guess. So, uh, yeah, that's what we're looking forward to, so.